Thank you, Dr. Greenway, for that introduction and for the privilege of doing what I've been doing for four decades, privilege to open the book of God to the people of God in chapel here at Southwestern Seminary. You know, 50 years ago when I was basically spending most of my waking hours on this campus in the NDIV program, I never missed chapel. Uh, I, except when my buddy Jack Graham would drag me away down to JD's barbecue or somewhere else to eat during that time. But I always loved to come to chapel. And I look back over my life and the ministry I've received from the Lord, and I can remember one or two of the real defining moments in my life when God set the course uh, uh, in many ways, a direction and ministry and life happened sitting in chapel at Southwestern Seminary. When a word fitly spoken that God had prepared just for my heart at a particular point in time and need was there. So I, I want to encourage you to make chapel uh, a significant priority in your life. Let's open our Bibles to the Revelation, the 14th chapter, and verse 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Their works follow them. You know, that's the reason we don't go to the judgment seat of Christ the minute we die. We await the end of human history as we know it, the return of our Lord, when we stand there before him and the, uh, receive what rewards are there for us to lay at his feet. It's because after we're dead, our works continue to follow us. And this has never been more true than in the lives of two iconic titanic figures of the first half of Western ecclesiology, and particularly Baptist history. J. Frank Norris, pastor of the First Baptist Church in Fort Worth from 1909 to 1952, and George W. Truett, pastor of the First Baptist Church in Dallas from 1897 to 1944. These were world figures, these men. They traveled the world before there was air travel. Uh, the, the, the ministry that they both received from the Lord is almost incomprehensible when we think of it in today's terms. And so what I want to do today from the book Dr. Greenway mentioned, In the Name of God, these two clashing lives and legacies, is to draw a few lessons that we can learn because I've preached here many times. I don't know that I've ever come to this pulpit with what I thought was a more applicable message for our day and time, even though we're talking about people who lived and ministered a hundred years ago, uh, than this one today. Uh, in a day of mega churches in every city, it's difficult for us to really understand and comprehend the magnitude of these two pastors. On the 10th anniversary of Dr. Norris's pastorate here in Fort Worth, downtown at 4th and Throckmorton Street, where his church was located, on his 10th anniversary in 1919, 12,000 people were in attendance in the multiple services. And the population of Fort Worth was less than 100,000 people. Think about that. In today's terminology, if it, it, it would, that would be like having 100,000 people in worship downtown Fort Worth last Sunday. Uh, it was the largest church in the world for over a couple of decades, uh, only challenged and equaled on many counts by the church in Dallas, pastored by Dr. Truitt. You know, I, I wrote this book out of a stewardship of a claim of my life on both of these lives. My father was 18 years old in 1925, and he was singing in the youth choir at First Baptist Dallas Law, uh, First Baptist Fort Worth Lost, standing next to his good friend Noel Snow, who became a director of missions here in Texas for decades. 
And in the time of invitation, Noel saw my father with tears coming down his eyes. And, and Noel said, Otis, wouldn't you like to give your heart to Christ? And he, he took him by the arm and took him down to the altar. Dr. Norris came down from the pulpit and knelt by my dad. And my dad trusted Christ as his personal savior. My great uncle, Harry Keaton, was chairman of deacons at First Baptist Fort Worth for many, many years. He was saved in, a, in one of the sensational ways that Norris attracted crowds. Uh, back in the second decade of the 20th century, that was before Major League Baseball came to Texas or, or anywhere in the Southwest. And so uh, Texas League and baseball was the thing for Dallas and Fort Worth. And there, on a given year, Dallas and Fort Worth, the Dallas Eagles and the Fort Worth Cats played for the Texas League Baseball Championship and Dallas beat Fort Worth. And Norris put out banners all over downtown saying, why Dallas beat Fort Worth in baseball? Here, J. Frank Norris, 7.30 Sunday night. And thousands of people came and standing room only. And my great uncle who was lost who was a textile merchant here and part owner of the Fort Worth Cats, went to that service that night. Dr. Norris stood up and said, why did Fort Worth, the Dallas beat Fort Worth in baseball? Because they were better prepared. And he opened his Bible to Amos and he read that passage, prepare to meet thy God. And he never mentioned baseball again. He just preached on making preparation to meet God. My great uncle was saved that night and served that church the rest of his life as chairman of deacons. And then it was my privilege to preach hundreds of sermons in the same pulpit where George W. Truett preached thousands of sermons. And to pastor during those days, many of his sweet family. Dr. Oscar Marchman was his nephew. Uh, the, 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 uh, the, uh, he was a great medical doctor there in Dallas. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the great nephew of his wife's sister. And, and Dr. Marchman uh, ushered right there on the front row every Sunday at First Baptist Dallas, immaculately dressed, one of my greatest supporters. His father, the son-in-law of George W. Truett, was the one who took care of Dr. Truett in his days when he died of that agonizing death of bone cancer in his home. Uh, Josephine Nash sat right over here. She was married, uh, uh, named after uh, Dr. Truett's wife, Josephine. Uh, she, she was his niece. Many of the stories in this book I got from interviews uh, from Josephine. I was privileged to pastor his family. So I've come to this with a great love and appreciation for both of these men. And as Dr. Greenway meant, uh, mentioned, those of you who are in Southwestern Seminary today owe a great debt to these two people. And while Dr. Truett's picture is over there, used to be in the rotunda, now it's in the uh, foyer of the chapel, is that correct? For decades it's been there. He was chairman of the board of trustees here for years and years and years. While he was so identified with Southwestern Seminary, at the beginning when Dr. Carroll wanted to move it from Waco, the Bible department, up here to a full-fledged seminary in the Metroplex, Dr. Truett was against it. He didn't want it to leave his, quote, beloved Baylor. And by the sheer force of his personality, he was appointed chairman of a committee that was to find a place for the seminary to, 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 be, to be placed. And he picked two small lots in South Dallas in the Oak Cliff section. At two lots where two houses could fit. And... Dr. Carroll wrote him the most scorching letter I'm sure that Truett ever received in his life. And he let him know in there, and he put it in all caps, that this was not going to be some two-bit, tin-horn seminary. At the same time, J. Frank Norris owned the Baptist Standard and was editor of the Baptist Standard in Dallas. And he took up Dr. Carroll's cause and put it on the front page of the Standard where every Texas Baptist read it every week. And to make a long story short, in 1909, when the PGCT met at the First Baptist Church in Dallas, it was Norris, not Truett, standing with the, with the tall, distinguished B.H. Carroll, making the plea and receiving the approval to move the seminary here to Fort Worth. Alan McCle uh, McLeaver, who is the uh, Texas Baptist 
uh, historical guru and professor at Baylor and Truett said that when Southwestern Seminary moved to Fort Worth, no one outside B.H. Carroll did more to the establishment of the seminary here than J. Frank Norris. In, in 1909, he was called to First Baptist Fort Worth. It took $100,000 to initially get the seminary moved here. He raised half of it. When they got the property, they built Fort Worth Hall at a cost of $200,000. Norris rose, 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 uh, raised the first half of it from First Baptist Fort Worth. And so both of these men's lives are entwined in what we do here, who we are and why uh, we are here. So lessons learned, there, there are so many of them, but I, I wanna just pick out a few. Here's the first lesson I learned from studying these men's lives. And I hope that when people finish this book, and incidentally, I brought a box of books to give to you today. Faculties down here close to the front, they get them, if there are any left, you can have one. Uh, but here's the first lesson. Doc, uh, never allow denominational loyalty to trump doctrinal loyalty and fidelity. That's a tension when you're a member of a big denomination like we are. It has so many arms and tentacles and so much good that's about that. J.B. Gambrell, who was a great Texas Baptist leader who actually married, performed the wedding ceremony of Frank and Lillian Norris in, in 1903. Gambrell made a great statement one time in the Baptist Standard when he said that denominational loyalty always goes straight to doctrinal fidelity. This became the North Star for J. Frank Norris's ministry. And it was exemplified Early on in 1920, during the evolution controversy here in Texas, a professor by the name of Rice over at SMU was advocating evolutionary process in the classroom. In those days, it was a solid conservative Methodist school. And our president here, Dr. Scarborough, and Dr. Norris joined together and came against him and exposed it. Made a long story short, uh, Dr. Rice had to resign over at SMU for it. A year later, a professor at Baylor by the name of Dow published a book called Introduction to Sociology. And in that book, he advocated for evolution and made it plain. He said that, that man began as a stooped over, squatty, half human, half animal. Well, Dr. Norris picked up this fight about what was going on at Baylor. And he was surprised that Dr. Scarborough wouldn't join him, nor would Dr. Truett nor would Palmer Brooks, the president, because they were engaged in one of the great campaigns in Southern Baptist life called the 75 million campaign, where they sought to raise $75 million first five years of the 1920s. And Truett said, we're not gonna get involved in that because it might hurt the 75 million campaign. And very subtly, as Tom Nettles observes in one of his books, denominational loyalty began to supersede doctrinal fidelity. In this current day in which we're living, you know, you are here today with a faculty that is solidly evangelical. Largely because 40 years ago, pastors like W.A. Crystal and Adrian Rogers and others decided that doctrinal loyalty was more important. When I was a student here, I started the MDiv in 1970. That's 51 years ago, if you, if you can't add. How's that possible? But it is. We had just come off the heels of, for those of you who don't know, a professor at Midwestern who lost his job, Ralph Elliott, because he wrote a book published by our own denominational press that discounted the historicity of the first 11 chapters of Genesis as if they were just myth. This was swirling around when we were here. When I was a student here, there was a president of another seminary over in Louisville who in his Exodus commentary said that the, the burning bush in Exodus 3 that God spoke to Moses from, it really wasn't a burning bush. It was probably fall and the leaves were colored and the wind was blowing through and it appeared to be burning. And later in that same commentary of the irons that, that, that floated, in the days of Elisha, he said that really didn't happen. Elisha pulled a stick out and he reached down there and fished it out. People were discounting the miracle. Down in New Orleans, there was a professor 
who discounted the efficacy of the blood of Christ. This was all going on when I was a student here at Southwestern. Southwestern, by and large, was different from all those other schools. Uh, Jack and I sat under professors like Roy Fish, and I could go on Bill Toler, and James Leo Garrett, and Hubert Drumright, and on, Scott Tatum, on and on and on of these men who were solidly conservative, but we weren't exempt. My favorite professor my first year here was a young professor that had come in here, was sharp, articulate. I took first year Greek from him. I took New Testament from him. And the second year, I, I, I came back to, to class and dropped by his office to see him. And I went in his office, and there was a large framed portrait of Bootman in his office. And very subtly, Bootmanian theology and philosophy infiltrated his mind, and it wasn't long until Dr. Naylor dealt with him. He's no longer here a professor. But this was what was swirling in the days uh, when we came here as, 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 uh, as students. So don't ever allow denominational loyalty to supersede your doctrinal loyalty. Here's the second lesson. The fight for right never ends. Our works follow us. Uh, what, what J. Frank Norris failed to do in the 1920s, transform, transform a denomination, he succeeded in the 1980s, 30 years after his death. Because those architects of the conservative resurgence learned from him two things. One, you can't change a denomination from the outside. That's what Dr. Norris did. He railed on it from the outside. He, he, he fussed on it from the outside. He, he set up competing conventions when the Southern Baptist Convention would meet. He'd get another hall in the same city, and he continually fought it from the outside. And, and they learned that if you're going to really transform a denomination, it has to be from the inside. It took a lot of years of electing presidents who would appoint committees, who would appoint trustees to boards like this one, who were solidly conservative, but it succeeded. And the other thing they learned was what, well, actually, B.H. Carroll said it to Scarborough, as you know, when he gave him his charge, to take the issue, if nobody else heard you, to the common people of the churches, and they'll hear you. Norris called these the fellows from the forks of the creeks, and he mobilized thousands of them. And that's exactly what happened. 40 years ago. The fight never ends. No educational organization that I've ever heard of ever veers to the right. If it strays at all, it strays to the left. The fight never ends. I just talked to Dr. Hemphill a while ago. He was going out to teach the book of Galatians. That's why Paul wrote the book of Galatians. Uh, because he was correcting some false doctrine. The fight never ends. Our, a few years later, a, few, a couple of centuries later, Arius of Alexander began to propound that, that Christ was not co-equal and co-existent with the Father, but was created of the Father. And, th and that controversy brought them to a place called Nicaea in 325. And, and Athanasius was the great defender of the faith who stood up. And on through the centuries, if we had time, we could illustrate how this fight never ends one generation passing the torch to the next generation. Here's the third lesson. Integrity is your greatest asset. On moral and financial matters, both of these men led lives of near impeccable integrity. They both had wives that were so supportive that, that they both had love relationships with their wives in such a beautiful way. They both enjoyed the near unanimous loyalty of their people who heard them preach every Sunday, watched them live every Sunday, and live with them for decades. What's most important to you when you go out to ministry? Some people think it's intellect, knowledge. Just get all the knowledge you can get. Jack and I drove over here from Dallas today. We were talking about how many people we were in seminary with 50 years ago that never finished the race. And you know, this, you know what we concluded? There are only 10% of us we were in school with that we knew that really finished the race. And, and there were a lot of those guys that had a lot more intellect than I did. I'd sit and I, I'm thinking of one right now in Hebrews. In, in Hebrew class who knew more than anybody I've never seen a more brilliant person 
Uh, and yet, they didn't have any integrity. And they're out of the race. Integrity is your greatest asset. It's not intensity. Some people think just because somebody's got, uh, uh, is, is charismatic and, and has the ability to woo crowds and, 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 and move people with great uh, oratory ability and, and intensity and passion in what they do. I, I, there, were other, there were people we were in students with 50 years ago who had a lot more than we did, but we hadn't heard from them in 30 or 40 years. You know why? Because they didn't have any integrity and they're out of the race. Integrity is your greatest asset in ministry. So never allow denominational loyalty to supersede doctrinal loyalty. Remember that the fight never ends. It's going to go on. We're just passing the baton to you. It's going to be something else next, next decade. Integrity in ministry is your greatest asset. Here's the fourth one. Balance is the key to life and ministry. Most all we have ever read of George W. Truett has been hagiography. It's been rev- his son-in-law wrote his authorized biography. There's not one syllable of one sentence of anything of critical commentary about his life in three or four hundred pages. Most everything about Dr. Truett has been where people revered him and reverenced him. And while most everything that's ever been written about Norris until this book, which tells the truth about him also, has reviled him. Balance is the key. What I hope people find out when they read in in, in the name of God is that there is some good in those for whom we think the worst. You just think about that person in your own mind right now that you think the worst about. There's some good in them. And those we seem to put on pedestals, when we really get to know them, they dwindle into ordinary men. It's just like James said uh, about Elijah. He was a man of like nature as we are. There's not a lot of difference in any of us. And and so uh, strict, strident fundamentalism of the J. Frank Norris Sart. You know what it does? It draws its circle smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until everybody eventually is shut out. Even family and best friends. You can read about it in this book. It's a warning for strident fundamentalism that that's what it does. And we see it still in this day in which we live today. Norris never succeeded in dividing the Southern Baptist Convention, but he did succeed in dividing his own world fundamentalist network three or four times because that's what strident fundamentalism does. It keeps drawing its circle closer and closer. And and then every time I read these glowing words about Dr. Truett, who was a great man, but he was not infallible. I think of what Jesus said in Luke 6, 26, when he said, be careful, beware when all men speak well of you. If you're not preaching a gospel, if you're preaching some kind of a gospel where everybody's love, everybody's speaking well of you, it might be time to reevaluate your own message. Here's a fifth lesson. Always view culture through the lens of Scripture. Because what you know what happens with a lot of people? They, they view scripture through the lens of culture. Now, I could illustrate this with these two men in many ways, but to, uh, to apply it to our lives in a real situation which we're living in today is the fact, just take the issue of race. Uh, both of these men uh, are not very commendable when it comes to their issues of race. You say, well, that was in the 1920s, 1930s. That was a different culture in America. Everybody was like, no, everybody wasn't like that. J.M. Dawson down at First Baptist Waco had a church full of Klan members, and yet nobody was more articulate in the, in, in the stand against racial injustice than he was. And right here on this campus for years, T.B. Maston was raising that flag when nobody else was and under tremendous criticism for doing it. Take, for example, just to illustrate Dr. Truett. One of his most famous message was that religious liberty address he gave on the steps of the Capitol 
in Washington, D.C. If anybody's ever read anything about Truett, they've read about that religious liberty mission. In that message, he said, God wants free worshipers and no other kind. And even as those words escaped his lips, African Americans were never free to worship in the, past, in the church where he preached every Sunday. In the early part of the 20th century, he raised the money and founded Baylor Hospital, which is now this massive hospital system. Truett founded Baylor Hospital. He was the chairman of the board there for 30 years, and not one in his whole life, not one African-American physician ever was allowed hospital privileges in Baylor Hospital. In 1921, the largest Ku Klux Klan cell in America was in Dallas had 13,000 members, dues-paying members. And it had a steering committee of 100 of some of the leading citizens of <laughs> Dallas. I read a biography when I was pastor over there, and I've been sitting on this for 25 years, and it's, it's not in this book, but it's coming out in the Crystal book that's the sequel to this. I was pastor there and I read this and I saw this and I saw the list of those hundred names. I called down the records office and I said, do we have records every year of the church here? And, oh yeah, ever since Dr. Trick came in 97, we, I said, put out 1921 and I'm gonna come down there later and look at them. I, they put out 1921 and I took that list. I stopped counting when I got to about 35 or 40. Deacons and leaders in that church who were on the steering committee, allowed to be on the steering committee of the Ku Klux Klan. So the challenge for us is this, and the lesson I want all of us to learn from this is, you cannot view scripture when you view it through a lens of culture, whether it's a white supremacist culture or whatever the culture, you must view our culture always through the lens of scripture. It's a lesson to be learned here for every single one of us, and it's a tension that's constantly there. Here's a sixth one, and I'll just give you one more after this. The way I say it is it's a thin pancake that doesn't have two sides. Remember that. It's a pretty good lesson to learn. For over 70 years, most everything written about Norris has been one-sided. It, it, they've talked about how he... Uh, now, for example, to the faculty here at Southwestern, when he got in a big fight with Scarborough, he, he would send beautifully wrapped Christmas boxes uh, to the faculty, leave them on their porch of their home, and they would open them only to find rotten fruit in those boxes. Well, that's the legend that's gone on. Alan Lefevre told me the other day that T.B. Mashton told him that every Christmas, he got a box like that from Dr. Norris, and he said every time it was filled with beautiful, delicious, fresh fruit. So I don't know how that legend got started, but my point is uh, everything has two sides. Everything written about Dr. Truett uh, is almost one-sided. So what we tried to do in this book is to peel away the layers to get to the heart of the research to discover that like all other controversies, there are always two sides. There's a growing divide in SBC life today, again. And as you go out and engage the world in ministry, you're gonna face it. Remember that we have a tendency, a strong tendency to only view it from one side, to think that we're right 100% of the time and we only view it from our side. But these are good people. These are brothers and sisters, often on the other sides of these issues. And try to put yourself in their place. Try to see it from their side. And when you're a pastor, you're a church worker, and issues arise, and somebody, get, you know what I've always tried to do, and I, I, we learned this from our pastor, Fred Swain. When somebody criticizes me, and I get a letter that just rips me off, and I was in the pastor or something, you know what I've done? I've always thought, now, let me really see what they're saying here. And you know what I usually found out? There was a little grain of truth in something that person said that I could use and apply to my life that would more conform me to the image of Christ. So remember this. It's a thin pancake that doesn't have two sides. And here's the final, final, final lesson learned, and I'm through, and that's this. Don't wait until it's too late 
to reconcile your relationships. Right now, don't wait until it's too late. Both of these men did. Dr. Truett died a horrible death. Bone cancer of his left thigh. He was allergic to all the pain medication. He lay in his home for months and months, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, in excruciating pain. Near the end, he called Bob Coleman, who was his associate for 40 years, who served every wish and every desire that Truett ever made. He called Coleman to his bedside and he said, Bob, I don't want to die with bitterness in my heart toward any man, and I don't want to die with anybody having bitterness toward me. Call J. Frank Norris and ask him if he'll come and see me. Bob Coleman never made that call. And there was only one person that could have kept him from fulfilling that wish like he had done to every one of Dr. Truett's wishes for 40 years. And that was Josephine Truett, Crystal's, uh, Dr. Truett's wife, forbade Coleman to make the call. And one of the most beautiful reconciliations in all the world didn't take place. N nobody had a bigger scrap with each other than Norris and Scarborough, our president here. Because Dr. Scarborough did all of Dr. Truett's dirty work. Because as Keith Durso says in his brilliant and definitive uh, biography of Truett, uh, Thy Will Be Done, it says Truett continued to always remain serenely above the fray. So you never find him anywhere. You don't ever find him engaged. He's always getting somebody else to do his dirty work. And Dr. Scarborough was a, a hero to so many of us and to me. And he was scrappy. And most of Norris's big fights came with Dr. Scarborough. And Scarborough lay dying out at his daughter's home in West Texas. And some of the most tender letters I've ever read are in the archives here. Letters that Norris would write to Scarborough when he was dying. Scarborough died in 1945, was buried here at Greenwood Cemetery. Uh, in, in, in the late 40s, at Dr. Norris's seminary, Bible Baptist Seminary, there was a student named Bob Barker. His brother, uh, Dr. Uh, Barker, who was, was the founder of Worth Baptist Church here, he's 92 years old, I talked to him last week. Well, Barbara had only one, of the, only one of the cars in the seminary. And Dr. Norris said, I want you to pick me up 9 o'clock in the morning, and I want you to take me somewhere. So there he was at the point in time. Norris came down from his office, had a bouquet of flowers, drive me out west. And, and Barbara said they drove out west to where they came to a cemetery. And he said, now park the, he parked the car, and he said, y'all stay in the car. I'm gonna, I've got business to take care of. And he said, Dr. Norris walked away across the, the graves, over a hill out of sight. 30 minutes later, he came back without those flowers. He said, now, now get me back to my office. You boys get back in class. And Barbara said, we took him back to his office. Of course, we didn't go back to class. We drove straight back to the cemetery. And we walked all over that cemetery until we found that bouquet of flowers on the grave of L.R. Scarborough. Don't wait until it's too late to reconcile your differences. So a takeaway Make sure you model your life. Who, after who? J. Frank Norris? George W. Truett? Neither. There's only one model for us, and as the writer of Hebrews, Paul or Luke or Apollos or whomever you believe wrote Hebrews, it says in chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore, since we are surrounded so, by so great a cloud of witnesses, can you see them? B.H. Carroll, Frank Norris, George Truett, L.R. Scarborough, Roy Fish, all oh, this great cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, looking unto Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the Father on high. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, that they may rest 
from their labors and their works do follow them. Father, seal these words in our heart, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.